How are you guys doing today? Good. Well, Happy New Year to you too, yeah. Uh, my name is Matt Dumas. Happy 2020. It sounds kind of weird. If you're a Czech writer, I know there's not very many of those left. Now you have to put the 20 instead of the 19. Sorry, side note. Uh, my name is, <laughs> did I say my name? Matt Dumas? Okay, I did. Okay, thank you. Third time, sometimes you forget. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, this is the uh, new year, right? Uh, new year. Um, you know, a lot, this is a time when, when a lot of folks will, spend, uh, will think about the last year, 2019, and they'll kind of evaluate. They'll, they'll look at their lives and they'll, they'll say, okay, so what are some of the things I learned this past year? What were the ups and downs? What uh, were the good things that happened? And, and where am I in my relationships, right? Where am I in this, uh, uh, my relationship with God and my relationship with other folks? What are some big wins from the year? What are my favorite memories? What are my biggest disappointments? And uh, for a lot of folks, they, they do that, and then they spend some time thinking about 2020 and say, well, well, how can I do things differently, or, or how can I do it better, or how can I be more intentional about my relationships? How can I, uh, I don't know, learn a skill, <laughs> challenge myself to, to do something this next year? Uh, how can I finish well? You know, we as a church want to help you in doing that, especially on this resolve part, uh, to thinking about 2020, um, because we know that, that, you know, we all need encouragement in the Christian life, right? We all need encouragement in keeping on, keeping on. And so we have this series called Essentials that we came up with, because we know that in the busyness of life, that, that we're all kind of the same in a lot of ways, Right, uh, school's about to start up. I know it's bad news for some, uh, but school will be starting back up for some tomorrow. Uh, you've got uh, pressures at work and at home. You got extracurricular activities, and in the busyness of life, if we're honest, the the thing that tends to go first is our relationship with Jesus. That tends to be the place where we we, we kind of fudge on it, or we kind of say, you know what, I'll get to that tomorrow. And so we get behind in our Bible reading, or we, we forget to pray for a day, and, and then it's two days, and then it's a week, and then it's been a long time. We, we skip our, our weekly group time or Bible study or whatever it is, that I know that those things happen for us. And so we, this series, this essential series is designed not only to remind us of, of what it is we believe and why we believe it, the, the essentials of, of Christian faith, but my hope is, is that it will ignite within you a passion to pursue your Savior. Last week, Jerry kicked off the series with worship. Today, we're going to talk about Scripture. Please turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today, and Lord, just for your word. And the power that it has to transform our lives as your spirit takes the truth and, and does what only he can do. Father, I thank you for Kim and for her story and the way that you used your word to transform her life. Father, for the way that you're using her now in, in CareNet to impact many lives in this valley, for uh, the lives of babies that have been saved and, and for mommies and daddies who have passed from death to life and uh, are now sons and daughters of you. And Lord, I pray that as we spend time in your word today, as we spend time looking at this passage, that, um, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would challenge us and that you would convict us and, and that we would have that desire just to spend time getting to know you better and better. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two propositional truths that Christianity rises and falls on. Two foundational, um, we'll call them assumptions, that if they are not true, then there is no Christianity. The first of those is that God exists. If there is no God, there is no Christianity. The second of those is that God has chosen to reveal himself. On those two principles, if, if there is no God or if he's chosen not to reveal himself, then there is no Christianity. You have to have both. 
The Bible starts off, in the beginning, God. There's no explanation of where God came from. There's no argument for his existence. God just is. And the God who is created all that is. And how did he create it? By his word. Throughout Genesis chapter 1, we see the refrain over and over again. Then God said, and there was. 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 How did God create? Then God said, and there was. The Gospel of John starts off with a similar in the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Then God said, and there was. And Genesis chapter 1, God creates His masterwork, the, the universe that we now live in. And the crowning achievement was man and woman, mankind whom he created in his image to rule on his behalf, to represent him to the rest of creation. So that when the rest of the created order looked to us, guess who they would see? They would see a reflection of the creator. And that meant for that to be possible for us to represent him well. That means we had to somehow know him. We had to know him well enough that we could represent him to, to the rest of creation. So far, so good. And in Genesis chapter 2, uh, God takes the man that he created and he places him in a garden and gives him two things. A job and a wife. Neither one is a curse. The job's not a curse, and the other one's not a curse, right? Just kidding. He also gives him one, thou shalt not, right? Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's kind of an intriguing name, the the knowledge of good and evil. Because see, up until this time in Genesis, we've only seen the good. God saw what he had made, and he said, It is good. It is good. It is good. It is very good. So far, we don't know anything about evil. Up to this point in the story, there is no evil. Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent enters the story. Deception, believing the lie, eating the fruit rebelling against the creator sin death creation falls and all hell breaks loose our job was to represent god to the rest of creation right we we bore the image of our creator we were made in his likeness which means that somehow we are like god Not in all ways, but in some ways, we are like God. We are like Him in this. We knew what was good. It was what God said was good over and over again. That's good. We knew that. We were like our Creator in knowing good. So what was the serpent promising when he said you can be like God, knowing good and evil? This is what he was promising. You don't need God to determine good and evil. You can decide what's good. And you can decide what's evil. You can decide what's true. And you can decide what's false. You can decide what's right. And you can decide what's wrong. And Adam and Eve believed the lie. They listened to the serpent. God said that uh, disobedience would bring death, that, that, that if they rebelled against him, that there were consequences for that. And so death occurred. Sin and death then entered the good world that God had made corrupting and twisting it to the, the dark uh, desires of the serpent. 
and the good and benevolent rule that the man and his wife were to have over all of creation was now forfeit. And now they would decide truth for themselves. Now they would decide right and wrong apart from God. Relativism, being woke, whatever that means. Progressivism, that's not new. That's been around since the garden. Right? Deciding truth for ourselves, deciding right and wrong, getting angry when people disagree with us, that's been around since the garden. And that's our default position, is to write God out of the script and to do things our own way. Sin will always take us in that direction. But the good news is sin doesn't have to have the last word. Right? That, that even in our darkest moment, God made a promise in Genesis 3.15 that he would send a Savior. Someone who would not only save us from our sin but it's the one who would give us new life. And that when he came, that, that, that somehow God's Spirit would then begin to live within us, that, that we would be new creations, that we would have this thing called everlasting life, that Jesus would change everything. And if you've trusted in Jesus, guess what? He has changed everything. But not yet. You see, there's, I'm going to use a big word for on you. It's called ontological. So say, if you can repeat after me, ontologically. Ontologically, everything has changed. That means in your being, in who you are, everything has changed. When you trusted in Jesus, you became a new creation. The old was gone, the new has come. The old man is dead, the new man is here. You've gone from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved son. Ontologically, you are a different person. But God did not choose to overwrite the programming in your head. He did not choose to, 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 to change your worldview all at once. So while in one sense everything is different, yet we're still waiting for the moment when everything is different. That God has given us His Spirit. He's given us a new heart, but every day we must choose to follow him. Now the whole thing in Genesis 3, theologians call it the fall. We, you might ask the question, uh, what does that have to do with the word? What does that have to do with scripture? You see, when we fail, death occurred. Spiritual death Emotional death, physical death, and intellectual death. Our minds, Paul, Paul says, were darkened when we fail. And so our default is always going to run back to self. It's always going to run back to making my own choices. It's always going to run back to, to deciding for myself what's right and wrong. And it's only the Word that can transform that. It's only the Word that can change that. It's only when I choose to follow God and do what God says that that can happen. Now, how do I know what God says? You guys are following me. Good. <laughs> By spending time in His Word. That's the only way I know what God says. And if I don't spend time in God's Word, I don't know what He says. And if I don't know what He says, I can't do what He tells me to do. I have to spend time in God's Word. And as I do, uh, I find that the Word has a transforming effect. Here's, the, here's the, the, the amazing thing. The God of the universe has given us the owner's manual. It tells you how you live your life. It actually tells you what's right and wrong, what's true and false, what's good and what's evil. It tells you why you were created and what you were saved for. It's all right there. It even tells you how the world is supposed to work, how God designed it to work, despite 
the, the, the corrupting influence of the serpent, all right there in the owner's manual. The Word, the Bible, the Scriptures, they reorient our thinking. It, it, it realigns us to see what is true, what is good, and what is right. It gives us instructions on how to live this life. It teaches, it reproves, it rebukes, it, it trains in righteousness. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces uh, to, the, to the innermost being of who I am. It judges the thoughts and intents of my heart. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's honey to my lips and food for my soul. And by it, and by God's Word, God's Spirit then transforms me to live and love like Jesus. Peter, writing at the end of his life, knows that death is soon coming. And like anyone at the end of their life, he begins to evaluate how he lived this life. He looks back over the landscape and he says, man, I did some things really well and I did some things not so well. Right? That Peter's the one, the first of the disciples to say to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But in just a few verses, Jesus has to rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. That Peter is the one. When Jesus warns him, Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, says, no way, that's not happening to me. I'm too big and strong for that. They're not going to get me. And Jesus has to warn him. Complete failure is coming. And, with that, and within hours, he denies his Lord three times. What a horrible night. And then he's uh, on the beach that morning and Jesus calls him aside and, and reinstates him and says, take care of my sheep. And Peter stands up at Pentecost and he, he, he preaches his sermon and over 3,000 people are saved. And Peter is the one who welcomes in the Samaritans and, and the Gentiles along with the Jews in this thing called the church. But he's rebuked by Paul for his hypocrisy. Peter's life has gone up and down. He's had good times and bad times. He's, he's done it well and he's fallen flat on his face. What's worse, to deny or betray? He knows profound failure. But he also knows how to finish well. And so he writes this letter to future generations of believers to challenge them and to encourage them to, to, to pursue the Christian life and to go from falling to finishing well. Let's take a look at verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. God has already given you everything that you need to live this Christian life. Everything that you need, you already have. There's not a, a, an extra special thing you're going to get later. You have already received everything that you need. Peter uses two pronouns here. He says us and you. When he says us, he's talking about himself and the apostles. When he's talking about you, guess who that is? You, right? Through us. Now, in 
Acts, I made a big deal out of this, the capital A apostles. They're the ones who spent time with Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching his miracles, that, that they're the ones who were instructed by Jesus personally, that they were the living New Testament, and they are the guys who would write out uh, what we have as the New Testament in our Bible. And that the capital A apostles and the capital, we'll call them capital P prophets from the Old Testament, that those guys together give us what we call the scriptures. So the first thing that we have uh, that, that uh, equips us for the Christian life is the Scriptures. It's the Bible. You didn't know it was that valuable, did you? Everything you need for life and godliness, the first thing is the Bible. You have it in your hands. Hopefully, or on your tablet or your phone or we have so access to it so many different ways. But, but the Bible, right? That's how we know you have knowledge of God. And when Peter says knowledge, he's not just talking about, uh, not, not just saying you know about God or that you know of God. He means that you can know God. You can experience God. That we know who God is. We can look at creation and we can tell some things about God. We can say, man, he's a big God, right? If he made this whole thing, he's a pretty big God and he's a powerful God and he's a creative God and he's an intelligent God. We can know all those things about him, but we can't know how, how loving he is, can we? I don't know, we might have hints when we see a, a mother with her baby. We might think that, okay, well, maybe that's a part of his character, but I only know God through his word. That's how I get to know him. That's how I know that a man who died on a cross, a brutal and horrible death 2,000 years ago, means anything for me today. Otherwise, it's just a current event at the time. Another man gets murdered in Rome. How do I know it has impact for me? God's word. Right? God's word is what tells me what truth is. And it orients me to, to what's right. That's God's word. Right? That's how I knew about a guy named Jesus. His glory and his excellencies and the light that he offers for me is through his word. Through his word. And the second thing we've been given is his spirit. Peter says you become uh, uh, partakers of the divine being. Remember that word ontologically? You became a son or a daughter of the king. It means you became a son or a daughter of God. That's that whole divine thing, capital D. You became a partaker of his nature because his spirit now lives in you. You are a part of that thing called the church which is his body, right? You've been getting everything you need. Knowledge of God through his word, the promises of God that, he, that Jesus will one day return, and we have a future inheritance, and now the spirit of God who indwells us and confirms the truth of all those things. You've been getting everything you need to live the Christian life. Life, Peter says. And through the Spirit and Scripture, God has provided everything not to, that we need right now, not only to know Him, but also to pursue Christ, the Christian life and escape the things of this world that cause us to stumble. Let's take a look at verse 5. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So having been equipped to live the Christian life, remember those two things, God's Spirit 
in God's word. Having been equipped with that, then Peter now gives us seven virtues, seven things that that are marks. We might say they're the benefits of time spent in God's Word. They they show uh, uh, the presence of Jesus' rule and reign in our lives. Seven things. In this list, when we begin to talk about it, Peter's going to say with all diligence, right? So that's, that's rolling up your sleeves. That's, that's getting your hands dirty. That's getting ready to go to work. And when we hear that, we might go, well, what about God's grace? Doesn't that contradict the whole thing of being saved by grace? And here's the beautiful mystery of sanctification. Right, that, that, that in, in sanctification, that, that, that God calls us to do some things. To spend time in His Word. To spend time in prayer. To spend time with other believers. To live a generous life. To share your story. That, that He calls us to do some things. It's a divine partnership, but it's by no means equal. We actually have the easy part in the deal. He does all the heavy lifting. Because as I do those things, guess what he does? He transforms me from the inside out. He begins to change me. I can tell you reading something doesn't change me. God changes me. I could read his word every day, but if the spirit isn't working, if he's not doing his part, I I won't be transformed. It's only God that can transform us, but he calls us into this thing, this partnership, this relationship. He calls us to walk with him, to follow after him. He who hears my words and does them. Paul says it this way. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. But he goes on to say, For it is God who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. That God calls us to to follow after him, and it's only the Spirit who can transform us, but our job is to put ourselves in a place where his transforming power can be at work in our lives. With all diligence, uh, Peter says this. He says, to your faith, so the starting point is faith, right? So you can anchor it down right there, faith. What does that mean? Who is he talking to? Believers. Right? You, that, the, your starting point is you have to trust in Jesus. Right? You don't even get on the track until you trust in Jesus. Right? To your faith. Anchor that bad boy down. To your faith. Add moral excellence. Now what's moral excellence? That's doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Right? Right? It's doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So when I first trust Jesus, and I'm thinking about, okay, so what am I going to do now? I know I probably shouldn't kick my dog. That's not a good idea. So I'm no longer going to kick my dog. Even if my neighbor's kicking their dog, and my best friend's kicking his dog, and everybody on the street is kicking their dog, I'm not going to kick my dog. I'm going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. If it's a cat different story. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, that's moral excellence. Do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. To your moral excellence, add knowledge. Now, where do you think that knowledge comes from? The Word, right? Good, you guys are following along. Through the Bible. It's, it's as I read the Word, as I, uh, then, then I, I begin to learn more. It's not just not kicking my dog. I actually have to be nice to my neighbor now. Now, how many of you guys know the right thing to do in most situations? Most situations. Uh, Keep them up high. I want them real high, real high. Okay, so now keep them up. Uh, Now, how many of you do the right thing every time in those situations? what, What happened? See, that's why you start with moral excellence, that that commitment to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Because when you add that knowledge, and now all of a sudden I know there's some other things, just knowing doesn't mean I'm going to do it, does it? 
to knowledge you add self-control. So now I've got this list of things, right? Now you guys took your hands down, but self-control is I can keep my hand up because now that I know the right thing to do, I'm doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and I'm exercising self-control in that. What's well, perseverance? It's playing the long game, right? It's a marathon and not a sprint, It's don't give up, don't give in, Jesus wins. It's seeing the end and going, you know what, it may be a long way out there, but I'm going to keep after it. That's perseverance. Perseverance, godliness. That's Revelation chapter 12. We talked about that, the overcomer. And how did they overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. That's godliness. Putting God first no matter what. In every situation and in all your relationship, God comes first. And each of those qualities, uh, they're interlinked. You can't have one without the the other. They, they They work together. Those are all internal. And he says to godliness, add brotherly kindness. What is that? That's loving your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers. And that may be easier or harder than the next one. I'm not sure, sometimes. Because the next one is agape. It's love for everybody. It's the love that um, looks out for the other person's good without allowing myself to get in the way. It's reflecting the love of Jesus to everybody I come in contact with. And each of those links in the chain, they're inseparable. They go together. You can't just work on one and go, oh, well, I, I'm going to go grow in knowledge, but I don't need self-control. Or I'm going to grow in love, but I don't need, I don't know, perseverance. They all go together. And it's not a one and done. I don't go through the list and go, oh, whew, man, now I've arrived. It's a lifelong pursuit. I can keep after this. Keep, keep, keep. Show diligence. Keep working at it. And Peter says that as we do that, as we pursue the Christian life that way, he says it will render you neither uh, useless or unfruitful. Uh, Another way to say that is you'll be both useless and fruitful. In your life now, in your Christian life now, that you'll be one who has an impact for the kingdom right now. with future benefits. Right? Peter, in his mind, he's, he, he, he's probably thinking about the king in the parable of the minnows who says, well done, good and faithful servant. That right now, you're investing in the kingdom. And it's going to have future uh, benefits uh, later on. You'll be both useful and productive, which means you'll live in love like Jesus if you pursue the Christian life. That's good news. Here's the bad news. What happens if you don't? What happens if you just decide, yeah, that's just too much hard work? I've trusted in Jesus. That's kind of enough for me. He says you're blind or short-sighted. What that means is this. It means that you no longer see spiritual truth. You no longer recognize the spiritual realities. You don't see God's fingerprints at work around you. That all you see is the, 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 what's right in front of you. All you see is the physical. All you see is my problems right now. All you see is your current circumstances. All you can see is the problems and, and the frustrations. And that's all that you are left with. Because you can't see the spiritual realities out there. You become blind to them. And not only do you become blind to the spiritual, God's work around there, he says that you can actually forget what Jesus has done for you. You can forget that he saved you from that. And when you forget that, you begin to live like everybody else. You began to look like everybody else. People who come to your house couldn't tell whether or not you're a believer. They'd have no idea. They might actually be surprised. 
your coworkers, if someone were to ask them or to tell them, hey, do you know your so-and-so goes to, uh, that if they go to your church, what? I don't, I had no idea. Kind of shocked. That, that you've forgotten your purifications from your former sins. That you're living in the here and now. And here's the thing. Probably even bigger than that. You've forgotten that your king is coming back. And that your king is going to say, what did you do with the minute I gave to you? What did you do with the gospel that I entrusted to you? How did you live this life that was such a gift to you? What did you do with it? I don't know. I guess I buried it. I was too busy. I had things to do. I, was, I had accomplishments. I had all kinds of things I was pursuing after. I didn't have time for this thing called the Christian life. I just didn't have time. You wicked, lazy slave. That when we fail to pursue the Christian life, that we forget that our king is coming back and that he will demand an accounting for how we lived our lives. Being transformed to live and love like Jesus is the whole goal of the Christian life. And the good news is you have already been given everything you need to do that. You've been given God's spirit and God's word. You have, every, you have all the resources that you need to live the kind of life that God calls you to live. And now he just says, go and do it. Right? Go and do it. Pursue a, Christ, a, a Christ-like life. And I know we all want to finish strong. And as I look around this room, I know there are lots of folks that are already on, well on that path. I know there are lots of folks in this room that are investing in the lives of other people that are taking that minute and they're planting it in other people's lives and they're sharing their story and they're, they're helping build up the faith of a younger generation. And whether that's here in a ministry at Central, whether it's in the community through something like CareNet, whatever it is, that they're, they're investing their lives and their time in kingdom purposes. And I would say, well done. Keep going. It's hard work, but it's well worth it. You know, uh, there is no pause or neutral in life. Sometimes we wish we could let the engine just idle a little bit. We've gotten to a point where we feel like, man, let's just, let's just kind of leave it here and, and, and everything will be okay. But you're either growing or you're not. Right? You're either progressing or you're regressing. You're, 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 you're uh, getting better or you're getting worse. That's just the way life works, right? If you, you want to get stronger and faster and more agile, you don't ride a bike, do you? I'm kidding. That was for Brian. I don't even know he's out here. You go to the gym and you, you spend the time, you run on the track, you, you ride your bike, you do whatever it is, you, you put out the physical uh, energies that you need, you eat the right food so that you can get stronger and faster and more agile. Intellectually, I know some of you folks are in school and you think that, man, as soon as I graduate, I am never going to read another book again. Please don't do that. Because here's the thing. Once you start, stop learning, guess what your brain does? Shrinks. You actually get dumber the older you get if you don't keep learning. Now don't look at your neighbor. Right? The, the, the older you get, if you're not learning more, then your brain is shrinking. You're getting less intelligent. Man, I should say it that way. I won't say stupid, right? I can't say that. Okay. Emotionally. If you, if you withdraw from people and you, you isolate yourself, you lose the ability to, to, to relate to them. You, you lose those connection pieces that, that help you have relationships with other folks. 
It works in every other area of our life. Why do we miss that? That spiritually, if I'm not growing spiritually, I'm shrinking. If I'm not pursuing after Jesus, I'm falling away from him. You know, a lot of you maybe this past year spent time in a Bible study or you spent some time and you feel like, man, I grew a whole lot this past year and, and I, I just want to kind of, I'm going to coast for a little bit. I'm going to stay right there. You don't coast. You fall back. Right? You, you go down. And maybe you started off well and maybe you had really good intentions and, or maybe you didn't. You know, man, I really blew it. What do I do now? It's too late, isn't it? You know what Peter would say? He would say, I, I, knew you, I know you blew it. I know you face planted on that thing last year or, or, or this year. I know you haven't even started this year well. I know you've messed up. Peter would say, welcome to the crowd. Right? I have to. But he would say this to you. It's not too late to finish well. How do you do that? He, he, he would say, get back to the basics. You start with faith. Right? And then add moral excellence. Start doing the things that you know you should do. Spend time in God's Word and allow His Word, uh, His Spirit to take His Word and to transform you from the inside out. We have a, a Bible reading plan that you can sign up for. And if you follow that plan, in a year you'll have read through the whole Bible. That's pretty awesome. But do something. Right? That, that, that if you're an athlete or if you're learning a new skill, an instrument or whatever, you know that, that, that the, the goal is out there and you want to be the best at what you are, but you have to take the baby steps today. Right? The big gains are pro possible, but you have to work up to it. Tortoise and not the hare. Training, not trying. But start. And let's resolve in 2020 to spend more time in God's Word, getting to know Him and pursuing after this thing called the Christian life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for, once again, this reminder from Your Word. That everything that we need to live the life that You call us to live, You've already given us. And that you just call us to into this relationship, as, as Kim talked about, not, not, not a church and not, not just a, a religion, but a relationship with you, getting to know you. So that we can reflect you better to the folks who are around us. And Lord, as we start this new year, I pray that we would resolve to spend time with you in your word and spend time in prayer and Spend time with other believers, living a generous life and sharing our story, Father, reflecting you to a watching world. And wherever we are on that journey, Lord, I pray that we would recommit ourselves. Recommit ourselves to you. And Father, if there's one who doesn't know you today, I pray today would be a day of salvation for them. You have already done all the heavy lifting. But through your Son, you've already provided the way for them to have a relationship with you. As Kim said, that they can know that they know that they know that they have a forever uh, in heaven in a kingdom with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.